In this video, we will talk about the spread of Christianity from the first century through the fourth century CE. According to a Pew Research poll in 2015, 31.2% of the world's population identify as part of the Christian religious tradition. Now, it's been about 2,000 years since the foundation of Christianity, and this percentage has grown immensely from just a few followers to the largest world religious group. So let's take a look at how this developed, at least over the first four centuries. What we come to call Christianity in later centuries originally began as something that most people in the New Testament called the way. Now this way or this Jesus movement was very much a Jewish movement. Jesus himself, as well as his disciples, were all Jewish. Jesus is called rabbi, which is Hebrew for teacher, throughout the New Testament. At this point, Christianity is simply a Jewish sect, just like Pharisaism or Sadduceeism. There's not much distinction between this way or Jesus movement that we see in the Gospels and other Jewish sects, just like there's minor differences, uh, but they all fit within the same umbrella of the same religious tradition. Around the 30s CE, uh, after the death of Christ, we see in Acts 115 that there are approximately 120 followers of this movement. These are very few, uh, approximately 10 times how many disciples there were. And what we see here is that all of these people are witnesses. According to Robert Louis Wilkin in his book, The First Thousand Years, he writes, the first Christian community was made up of men and women who had known Jesus and were witnesses to his resurrection. Now what Wilkin is talking about here is not that they were witnesses in the fact that they simply watch Jesus get crucified or watch Jesus be resurrected, but that they were people who actually knew and learned alongside Jesus. They were people that knew and witnessed his character. So we have this very much Jewish movement with a few radical, uh, even rebellious ideas, but very much based in Judaism and Jewish learning. So the question we ask is at what point does this Jewish movement turn into or become the Christianity or Christian religious tradition, something entirely separate from Judaism? Uh, there are a couple different key points here. We see in Matthew 28:19 that Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, Jesus's ministry that we see in the gospels is exclusively to Jews. His focus is on talking to Jews uh, and helping them understand his message. What we see in Matthew 28 is that he asks his disciples uh, to go and make other disciples or followers from all nations. Uh, in Greek, the word that we use, Gentile, is the same word uh, for nations as well. So essentially, what Jesus is asking is to go uh, let the Gentiles know about this message as well. And Gentiles at this point are simply people who aren't Jewish. Um, it's not any specific religion, not necessarily pagan, but simply people who are not culturally Jewish. We also see in Acts 1.8, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, again, we see this intention of Jesus uh, in this story to take this gospel beyond just the Jews. Obviously, we have this focus on Jerusalem first uh, in Judea, which is primarily Jewish, uh, but also Samaria. And Samaria was a place that often had a lot of tensions with the Jews. They were both a mix of Gentile and Jewish culture um, and had a pretty bad history uh, with a lot of Jewish traditions. And the ends of the earth that we see here, 
um, many people, at least in the 21st century, take this to mean um, everywhere. Uh, but at this point that we see um, in other literature, the ends of the earth simply means Rome. So what Jesus is saying in Acts is not to go uh, let everybody know about this, but simply take this message to Rome, uh, to those in power. Starting in about Acts 8, uh, we start to see people who are not Jewish uh, join this Jesus movement or the way. Um, we see people who are Samaritans, um, the Ethiopian eunuch, and Romans, such as Cornelius the Centurion. What's important here is that uh, we see people of different uh, ethnicities, different nations, uh, and even different statuses. Um, the Centurion would be in a pretty uh, good position uh, as a Roman, as a Centurion, and to follow this Jesus movement uh, could be devastating to his career. We see this starting in Acts 8, uh, and after this point, we start to see um, almost a division in Christianity as we move forward. Now, there's no precise time when we can make the transition from calling this a Jewish movement to Christianity, um, but Acts 8 seems like a pretty good place to at least begin. When we start getting the incorporation of Gentiles into this Jewish movement, uh, we see a separation between what we would call Jewish Christians uh, and Gentile Christians. Now, Jewish Christians might sound um, perhaps ironic, uh, but that's essentially what Jesus' earliest followers were. Gentile Christians were simply people who were not culturally Jewish, uh, but decided to follow this very much Jewish Jesus movement. Now, some of the tensions that rose here were over uh, a lot of the laws that we see from the Hebrew Bible that Jews followed. These were things like food laws, observing festivals and holidays, and circumcision. Around the year 50 CE, the Jerusalem Council, uh, which was composed of some of the disciples, such as Peter, James, and Paul, met to discuss and determine whether Gentiles needed to follow Jewish law to become part of this movement or not. Now, in the 21st century, this might seem odd to us, uh, but remember that at this point, Christianity is still very much Jewish, and to be a Jew, you have to uphold Jewish law at this point. So the tension here was, uh, if a Gentile becomes Christian, do they have to be circumcised if they're male? If a Gentile becomes Christian, do they have to follow food laws, like eating kosher, such as not eating pork, or not eating meat and dairy together? Do they have to observe holidays like we do? Do they have to observe the Sabbath? And the Jerusalem Council eventually ruled that no, Jews or Gentiles did not have to follow Jewish or Mosaic law in order to become Christian. Now this event is probably the one that we can mark um, as the very beginning of what we would call Christianity, where there's very clear separation between what is Jewish and what is Christian. Now I've talked about the beginnings of Christianity, but the way that this spread uh, is essentially through the disciples and apostles. And one of the most famous, of course, is Paul the Apostle, who we see in the book of Acts, and through the rest of the epistles in the New Testament. Most of the epistles that we see were primarily written to Gentile audiences. There are some Jewish audiences as well, but most of the people uh, who are receiving those letters are Gentiles, who are trying to figure out how to be Christian, or how to uh, be Christian and absorb, observe some Jewish law or all of it, um, or how that applies to them. Now, Paul is a major figure uh, spreading Christianity, going to the East, um, and others spread Christianity different directions. However, there was an impediment to this, uh, and this was the Great Fire of Rome, which occurred around the year 64 CE. 
Now, in this year, uh, there were Jews who were uh, revolting and rebelling against the Roman Empire, um, both Christian Jews and non-Christian Jews. And this sparked some controversy, um, and Nero, the emperor at the time, was very upset with the Jews. Somehow, a fire broke out in Rome, and historians don't really know who started it. Uh, some claim that Nero actually was the one who started it himself. Um, some claim that it was the Christians or that it was the Jews. Whatever happened, uh, this event uh, sparked a way, uh, essentially, for Nero to begin persecuting uh, Jews as well as Christians, um, who are still part of this Jewish movement to some extent. Now, during this first century, um, even though there was some persecution, Christianity began to spread quite a bit. Uh, Paul's missions, when he goes to Rome, there's already a, a church founded there. When he goes to some other cities, they already have churches that were started not by him. So he's not the only one starting churches at this point. Uh, most people think that in Egypt in the first century, there was already a Christian church established. Um, probably in Alexandria. Apollos, who worked alongside Paul, and we see him in some of the epistles, was Alexandrian and probably took this message there. Now, when we talk about missionary journeys and the scope of early Christianity, we're not necessarily talking about people going and uh, telling others about this gospel that they have to convert to or believe in or even confess something. The idea here is simply that, um, a few things actually, and the first of these is that Christianity was very much a radical movement. For those who thought that following laws and traditions was necessary, um, Christianity offered, uh, to some extent, a relief of this. There's also this idea of rebellion against the empire. Jesus very clearly um, undermines uh, what the empire is doing and recognizes that a lot of the um, greedy ways uh, that the empire has are wrong, uh, according to his teachings. So perhaps for people who are uh, struggling with these kind of situations where they're being oppressed by their government, uh, Christianity would provide a way uh, for them to find some kind of hope or relief from that. Whatever it was that inspired these people to follow the tradition, uh, it did start gaining followers. As we move into the second century CE, uh, we see Christianity develop even more. In the early second century, we see Ignatius, who's the Bishop of Antioch in Syria. Uh, according to Wilkin, Ignatius's letters, quote, allow us a rare first-hand glimpse of the inner life of the Christian community as it was taking form at the beginning of the second century, end quote. At this point, churches were not separate entities. They were very much linked together. And Ignatius is the first to call these churches the Catholic Church. Now, in the 21st century, we think of the Catholic Church as the Roman Catholic Church. Um, with the Vatican City and, and the Pope. But at this point, the idea Catholic simply meant universal. The idea was that the church was something that was universal and connected, uh, but also had its own autonomy. We also start seeing a church hierarchy. Um, the idea is that we see bishops and deacons um, even beginning into ha having acolytes um, and other people who are part of this church structure uh, to help set up how it's supposed to run. However, even though, uh, as Ignatius says, this church was Catholic or universal, there were still divisions uh, among it. Just as we had divisions in the very early church between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, we start having divisions in the second century over how to practice Christianity, um, over how um, what text to follow, uh, since we didn't have a canon at this point, uh, and even over heresy. Now, 
we start having this distinction between what are considered orthodox or uh, acceptable teachings and what are considered heretical teachings or are not acceptable. And these divisions seem to especially start in the second century. Uh, one of these major practices is Gnosticism, which we'll talk about later in the course. As we move into the third century, uh, we start seeing Christianity develop even more. Um, however, during the first two centuries, uh, as Woka notes, there's nothing distinguishing. Uh, he claims Christianity as a body was largely invisible. There's nothing that would distinguish uh, a Christian from any other person. Christianity was not tied to a race or an ethnicity or a nation uh, or a class even. There's nothing that would stand out to make somebody Christian uh, versus anything else. The first mark that we really see Christianity leave behind is in the catacombs that we see in Rome uh, in the early third century. The Christians essentially built a graveyard uh, for their dead in Rome underground. We also see this emphasis on biblical study, beginning with Origen. Um, Origen was an early church thinker um, in the third century who thought that being Christian did not just mean uh, following Jesus's teachings, but also meant to study what was written down in the texts. Uh, remembering that we still don't have a canon at this point, uh, some of the texts that Origen talked about were not ones we would consider canonical today. Uh, but he thought that Christianity should be about learning, uh, as well as uh, some kind of faith perspective of following Jesus' teachings. And he thought that having some kind of Bible study, again, not in the way that we would think of in the 21st century, but people who were erudite and focused on studying and learning from these Christian texts was very important to this movement. The tradition of Christianity grows significantly uh, from the end of the first century up to 300 CE. Uh, by Wilkins' calculations, he says that by the end of the first century CE, so this would be uh, around the time uh, that approximately 30 years or so after Paul's death, um, Christianity probably made up 0.0017% of the population in the Roman Empire. Uh, this is not even a hundredth of a percent. Very small portion of the Roman Empire population was Christian. By the end of the second century, however, uh, he believes that approximately 0.36%, uh, so we're actually into the tenths here, of the population was Christian. As we move into 250 CE, uh, we have about 2% of the population uh, being part of this Christian movement. And by the time we get to the year 300 CE, this jumps significantly to about 10% of the population of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire is probably the most spread at this point, uh, but we do have small um, nations and city-states as well that presumably had some people who followed this tradition as well. Now, when we look at 250 CE, we do see a significant change from less than half a percent of the Roman Empire to 2% of the Roman Empire being Christian. Now, possibly because of this growth, uh, we see a rise in persecution of Christians. Many people think that the period from the death of Jesus up until uh, Constantine, who we'll talk about in a moment, was just rife with persecution of Christians. Uh, but this really isn't the case. There were a few um, times when Christians would be widely persecuted, such as the Great Fire of Rome, but they were usually um, small outbreaks and did not last for very long. Christianity was not really a major threat to the Roman Empire at this point. However, when the numbers started growing, uh, which we see around 250, uh, Christianity became problematic to the Romans. Uh, there are a couple different ideas here. The first is simply because being Christian meant you weren't culturally part of the Roman Empire and worshiping the Roman 
gods and pantheon. Remember that at this time, the Roman emperor was considered to be uh, deified or a god, essentially. So not worshiping Roman gods meant you weren't worshiping the emperor. Additionally, uh, Roman religion was part of their culture. They weren't necessarily concerned with converting people to their religion or having to follow strict rules and guide guidelines, but simply that everybody uh, believed and acted the same way. And Christians uh, who had very specific ideas, especially with purity um, and how to interact with society, would have kind of subverted that. And finally, as I noted before, Jesus' teachings were pretty radical to the Roman Empire. With Jesus proclaiming that he, as a human, uh, is also a god, this would be really problematic, especially when the Roman Emperor makes the same claim. So for these reasons, uh, and possibly others, persecution um, started to be pretty widespread starting at around 250 CE. And this is the first time that we actually see um, a general persecution of Christians, uh, not just you know, small groups here and there, but trying to wipe out Christianity as much as possible. Now, as we move into the fourth century CE, uh, we see that Christianity is very widespread at this point. Even though there's persecutions, uh, it doesn't wipe out Christianity as a whole. In some ways, uh, it even strengthens the movement. Uh, when people are willing to die for what they believe in, it often recruits more followers to it. In the fourth century, uh, possibly even a little bit before, Christianity becomes a legal religion. And this isn't by Constantine, although he often is credited with this, but a lot of previous emperors um, deemed that Christianity could be legal, uh, just not the dominant religion. They provided some freedom for Christians to worship as they wanted, as long as it didn't conflict uh, with the Roman Empire too much. Now, persecution had changed the church uh, quite a bit by this point. Obviously, some people uh, being martyred helped gain more followers because they were so willing to die for what they believed in. Um, other people decided that the movement was not for them, um, especially in the face of persecution. There were others who thought that they could kind of bridge the gap between being Christian and Roman uh, and essentially merge the two traditions. So Christianity looked quite a bit different as we move into the fourth century with different people having different ideas on what Christianity looks like uh, in the face of the Roman Empire. But in this fourth century, we have legal Christianity and we see Emperor Constantine, uh, often called Constantine the Great, come to power. Now, Constantine is not the first to legalize Christianity, as I noted, uh, but he is the first to actively ask Christians to pray for the empire. So instead of just the Romans praying to their gods, uh, he asks the Christians to pray to their god as well. In the three tens, uh, he quashes a rebellion against the Roman Empire, uh, against him, essentially. And as he goes into battle, uh, he claims to see a heavenly sign of God um, and also says that he saw this in a dream. So he marks this, um, which is described as essentially an X uh, with a vertical line through it. So often people think this is the letters Chai and Rho in Greek, uh, which are the first letters in the name Christ in Greek and has this marked on the shields of the soldiers. Now, Constantine is victorious, and he claims that this victory uh, is a sign that God favors him. Um, sometime in the 310s, uh, Constantine officially converted to Christianity, and as he went into Roman capitals, refused to actually go in the places where they would sacrifice to the Roman pantheon. So Constantine becomes the first Christian emperor. Uh, and this is essentially the point where Christianity becomes not just a legal religion, uh, 
uh, but a religion that's very highly integrated with politics. In 325 CE, we have the Council of Nicaea, which determines the Nicene Creed. This is the first church doctrine uh, and essentially has a meeting of all the bishops, um, the high up people in the Christian church from around the Roman Empire to meet and discuss what the new tenets of this new religion are. So with the rise of heresies such as Gnosticism or the rise of heresies such as anti-Trinitarianism, um, the Council of Nicaea developed something that explains what Christianity is all about. When we get to the year 380 CE, we have Theodosius I, uh, who's the Roman emperor at this time. And Theodosius not only has Christianity being a legal religion and not only converts, um, but makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. At this point, we leave off looking at the spread of Christianity. By the time that Christianity becomes an official religion, uh, it spreads like wildfire. It's very heavily integrated with the Roman Empire. Uh, and obviously, we have the Roman Catholic Church founded, which has its reaches very far, uh, both politically and religiously. If you're interested in learning more after the 4th century CE, I would highly recommend Robert Louis Wilkin, his book, The First Thousand Years, A Global History of Christianity. Now that we've reached the end of this video, you should be able to describe the beginnings of Christianity as a religious movement, explain how Christianity became a religious tradition apart from Judaism, explain how Christianity spread from the first century through the fourth century CE, and identify key events and figures during the history of early Christianity.